great to see so many so many new faces and some familiar ones as well. A little bit about the brain, um, aging brain and body series. The Chicagoland villages are working together to provide quarterly seminars that educate, bring awareness, and highlight the exceptional work at the leading dementia research centers being done related to brain and body health. The purpose of this series is to provide our community with information, interventions, techniques, and tools that support us all at various levels of mental and physical health and wellness. The Village of Chicago is just one of the four participating villages in this collaboration. My work is primarily focused on brain health and memory loss, helping people to navigate a dementia diagnosis. The Village of Chicago is a vibrant social network of people over 50 using our strengths to tackle challenges and to fulfill our potential throughout life. Our compelling programs impact social life, work, purpose, health, and wellness enriching quality of life for people of all ages. Now I'd like to introduce you to Phyllis Mitson of Skyline Village, Chicago. Phyllis. Great. Thank you, Jen. Since 2010, Skyline Village, Chicago's community of older adults has engaged in cultural, educational, and social programs. We are active, informed, and connected advocates within our unique, vibrant high-rise neighborhoods, including Streeterville, Gold Coast, the New East Side, and several other places, both near and far. During the pandemic, our goal was to stay connected to our members, neighbors, and friends. Social isolation was on our mind, as well as the societal impact of the George Floyd murder. We adjusted our programming to Zoom to address COVID with Dr. Michael Eisen from Northwestern, our rock star version of Dr. Fauci. We set up weekly conversations to check in on each other each other and developed a wide range of educational programs on racial justice and equity. Looking forward, we are planning a hybrid mix of programming, collaboration, and growth. We are pleased to be part of this collaboration. And now I'd like to inter uh, turn this over to Janie. Um, Jen Hi, Janie. <laughs> feel like I was muted. Am I good? Yes. Go? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you. Thank you, Phyllis. So I'm Janie Urbanic. I'm the founding director of the South Loop Village. And our mission in the South Loop is to enable our residents to age in community, enjoying the quality of life that they cherish for as long as they desire. We are a designated um, dementia friendly community. And one of our uh, strategic initiatives evolves around brain health. We uh, offer activities and programs encouraging healthy aging for the brain and the body, and we support research being conducted in, to advance this very important initiative. One of our activities is a monthly memory cafe that we will now be going back to in person, we're delighted to say, next month in July. So if you have any uh, interest in attending a memory cafe, please get in touch with the South Loop Village at southloopvillage.org. And now I'd like to turn it over to my good friend. Um, who am I turning it over to? Susan Alito, who is with uh, Chicago Hyde Park Village. Thank you, Janie. Chicago Hyde Park Village is very pleased to be working with our sister villages on this aging brain and body initiative. Although each village has responded to different needs and wishes in our communities, we all benefit from our collaborations. CHPV is based in Hyde Park, but we do not have official boundaries and we welcome all participants. We aspire to be an age-friendly, inclusive, caring community that supports vibrant, healthy aging. Our executive director, Michelle Dassinger, and our special projects manager, Dorothy Pytel, were instrumental in implementing Chicago's first official dementia-friendly community in Hyde Park. Our goal is to raise, aware raise awareness about dementia and its impact on families and friends, to reduce the stigma associated with it, and to implement strategies to achieve these goals. We invite anyone who's interested in this initiative to contact us. And I now turn the mic back to Jen Hurd, 
who will introduce Dr. Rogalski and our very special program today on Super Agers. Thank you, Susan. Dr. Emily Rogalski is a clinical and cognitive neuroscientist and professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Currently, she serves as associate director of the Meslem Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease, and as imaging core leader of the NIA-funded Alzheimer's Disease Center. Her research falls under the broad umbrella of aging and dementia and uses a multimodal approach to investigate two aging perspectives, primary progressive aphasia, PPA, in which neurodegenerative disease invades the language network, and superaging, in which individuals are seemingly resistant to the changes in memory associated with normal or more typical cognitive aging. Dr. Rogalski also develops educational programs, support groups, and person-centered intervention programs for families and individuals living with dementia. Without further ado, let's welcome her to the virtual stage, Dr. Emily Rogalski. Hello, everyone, and thank you for that kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen here and pull up some slides. So let's get those started. All right, so everybody should be able to see the slides. Um, and we're gonna talk about one of my, my favorite topics today and that is super agers. Um, so this will be a little bit of fun. It's not often that we get to talk about the things that are going right in aging, um, but that's what we're gonna do today and why that's relevant and important. Um, we're, we are so very pleased to have this partnership with all of the different villages and um, hope to continue this lasting relationship of, of, of collaborations and whether we're virtual or hybrid, whatever form it takes in the future, um, look forward to working with you on that. And uh, there will be time at the end for questions, so please write them down or keep them in your mind and we can address those um, at the end. Okay. So my name is Emily and I'm at Northwestern University. I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background on our center and who we are. Um, so our center is called the Mejulam Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease. And boy, is that a mouthful. Um, we, that just simply means that we do aging and dementia research and we're really focused on the brain. Um, but we are also a nationally funded Alzheimer's disease center, and that means that we're part of a group. Um, and this map up here shows uh, the more than 30 Alzheimer's disease centers that are funded by the National Institute on Aging. And we all work together as a big team, much as the villages are working together as the team with us today. And the, the uh, states that are in green are established Alzheimer's disease centers and the states that are in this turquoisey blue color um, are the ones that are um, newer Alzheimer's disease center. And we're trying to kind of fill in the map here and in increase um, coverage of the United States and that we still have a ways to go. But as Alzheimer's disease centers, we do some things exactly the same. Uh, we all uh, invite participants in the community to come and be a part of our research that is longitudinal in nature, which means that we ask people to come back year after year uh, to participate in memory and thinking tests. And some of you may be involved in our Alzheimer's Disease Center here. Um, and then uh, there are also ways that we are, are different. And um, the ways that we get to have personality or be different is that we, ha we have different themes at each Alzheimer's Disease Center. And our theme at our Alzheimer's Disease Center is heterogeneity in aging and dementia. And that's been our theme from the very, very beginning. So we recognized that there's no one size fits all um, solution to dementia care or to aging. And there's no one size fits all way to describe um, aging and how it, it, it happens to each of us individually. And so we appreciate and celebrate that that heterogeneity, and we, we do that in a few ways. So 
One of those ways is by taking different lenses. Um, so understanding um, from a, a cognitive standpoint, what are your strengths and challenges in, in memory and um, language and other abilities? Um, how is there heterogeneity in what we can see under the microscope of what's causing some of these changes in our thinking skills? Um, how does aging um, affect our personal identity and our family and life dynamics? And so we have research programs that are dedicated to each of these topics. And sometimes we say here at the center that we cover everything from cells to social work, because on the very same floor, we are all together with behavioral neurologists and uh, social workers and neuroscientists like myself, and some who are doing basic science and some who are working with real life people. And um, we have a variety of different research programs focused on each of these topics. Um, and so today we're going to we're going to focus on the super aging project. But um, before we get to that, I thought I would start us off with an audience question to see if we could get some engagement from the audience. And before we can really talk about super aging, it's really it's good to think about, well, what is dementia? What is normal aging? How are those things the same or different? So um, Lisa, if you could help bring up our first poll. So we're gonna try to be interactive today. Um, and so for those of you who might want to play along, um, you're gonna see hopefully something pop up on your screen that says poll in progress. And it, it's asking you the same question that, that is on the screen right now. Uh, dementia is a normal part of aging. Is that true or false? So we're getting good responses. Oh my goodness. We've gotten, oh wow, great responses. So I think we have, ooh, or almost to 100. We've got over 100 responses so far. And most of us are saying false, that dementia is not a part of normal aging. So I'm gonna wait just a couple more seconds. And I think we've got just, if you wanna get your answer in, if you don't wanna play, that's okay. Uh, there'll be more opportunities. We'll have a couple more of these polling questions for fun. So let's, let's, let's now move on. And um, so we see, I'm gonna share the results. You can see that most people are saying um, dementia is, is not a part of normal aging. So let's, let's, let's talk about that. Okay, so the thing about the term dementia in, and in our field in general is that um, there are lots of, um, the terminology we use can be very confu confusing and, and sometimes it's changed a bit over time. And so I thought I would walk you through the word dementia and what it, and what it means and kind of how those definitions have changed over time. So in the 1900s, is really when the first case of um, Alzheimer's was described. And at that time, it was thought that senility was a normal and inevitable part of aging. And that just is what, what, what happened. And then with time in the 1970s, it was recognized that de dementia was a disease and it's not a normal part of aging. And then now today, we understand that there are many different dementia syndromes and each is associated with a different cognitive profile. And so Alzheimer's dementia is that most common dementia syndrome. And that's the one that most of us are familiar with that generally starts with the loss of memory um, as the most salient or prominent syndrome, uh, symptom rather. Um, but there are other dementia syndromes uh, some of which we focus here at uh, focus on um, at our center. Um, one of those is primary progressive aphasia, where instead of memory being the primary symptom, individuals lose language. So they have that tip of the tongue phenomenon that we all experience from time to time, but they feel it with almost every conversation that they have. So now our our updated definition for dementia is it's a general term for the loss of memory or other thinking skills and it significantly interferes with one, one's daily life. Okay, so now that we've got that established, let's talk about aging. And unfortunately, when we think about aging, we, we mostly dwell on or talk about all of the, 
the changes that are associated that are with aging that are not always um, the changes that we're excited about. So um, there are changes to our eyesight that might happen. There are changes to our skin that may happen or our hair may get, may, may get gray. Um, and just like that, there are also changes that are associated with aging that occur in our brain. And so right now we're looking at a brain scan of a 27 year old and an 87 year old. And it's as if we were cutting right down through the top of my head and then looking forward at the brain. So this would be one side and the other side. And these boxes right here represent, um, they're highlighting a structure in the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is really, really important for memory. And what we noticed in aging, even in normal aging, is that there's more black space around um, where the hippocampus is supposed to be. And that, that black space is not a good thing. Um, it means that the hippocampus has shrunk. And because the hippocampus is important for memory and when it shrinks, it's been associated with or linked to changes in our memory performance. So I'm gonna blow up this last picture here so we can walk through it. So when we look at memory performance, that's what this big graph here is showing us. We look across the decades from our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And if we look at memory performance here on what we call the y-axis, higher numbers are better. We see that in our 40s is kind of maybe even our 30s might be when we kind of hit our peak memory performance. And then on average, uh, memory performance goes down and with, with normal aging. And so now this is gonna lead us to our second audience question. Um, do you think, is it true or false that cognitive decline is an inevitable consequence of aging? Okay, so everybody's participating again. So thank you everyone for such good participation. You guys are fast. We already have 79, whoa, 80. 90 people have participated. Okay, we'll give um, a few more seconds here to make sure everyone can find the button and decide if they wanna participate or not. Okay, we've got over 100 people participating. So I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. And then we're gonna share the results. This one's much closer. So 43% uh, um, of the audience members think that cognitive decline is an inevitable consequence of aging. And about 50% of you, 57% of you are, are more optimistic and say that it's, it's not inevitable. Okay, so let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Um, so now I'm showing you that very same graph that I showed you just a minute ago, but now it's got more dots on it. Um, and these dots actually represent real live individual people and in their and how they performed on this test of memory. And remember the higher scores are, are better. So this area means better performance than, than, than these dots over here. And I wanna point out a couple of different things. So this purple range shows you what we call the average range um, across the lifespan. And what we see is that the purple band is narrower in our 30s and 40s and it gets wider as we get older. And that's because um, with aging, there's more variability in performance. But the, the next exciting thing to kind of point out here are these um, triangles. And so instead of dots, I use triangles. They still were real data points from real life people. Um, and what this shows us got us excited. Um, it showed us that there's real life people that are performing as good, if not better than um, individuals in their 50s or 60s. And so this got us thinking about the idea of super aging and that maybe we could identify people who didn't experience um, memory loss as they age or, or not, uh, they were able to resist changes in memory. So now I'm gonna, put up a slightly different statement from the one I put up before. That cognitive decline may be a common consequence of aging, but it's not inevitable. And so that's that 
you could determine your cognitive age or your thinking age, not just by knowing your chronologic age, how old you were, but instead it's this combination of genetic factors and time and experience. Um, and so let's unpack this one step further and say, if we thought about simplified trajectories of aging, there, there might be a trajectory of pathologic aging. And this is what we would associate with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's dementia, where there's accelerated cognitive decline or dementia, and then severe restrictions in daily functioning. There might be normal aging, where there's some degree of cognitive decline, but um, it's not impacting one's daily life uh, to a great extent. And our question was, could we identify people who were super agers, who, who had little or no age-related uh, cognitive decline and that they remained highly functional in their later years? So that was the idea, uh, the theoretical idea behind the super aging study. And then we needed to put some rules around it. And so the rules that we chose were, we were looking for people who were super agers were defined as individuals who were over age 80. They had memory performance at least as good as individuals in, 50s, in their 50s and 60s, and they performed at least average on um, other, other tests of, of language and attention. And our goal is to identify these people, invite them to part participate in our research study, and invite them to come back year over year, and eventually donate their brain at the time of death. Um, we picked the age 80 because those individuals are at the greatest risk for memory loss. And so if they are able to avoid those changes in memory, um, that's quite remarkable. So let's go on to the next step. What is the super aging study program study? Um, we're interested in really looking, taking a, a multiple and a multiple perspectives and I, I start by really thinking about biological domains. So, we select superagers for their great memory performance, but we're interested in how long they're able to maintain that memory performance and how they're doing in other aspects of thinking. We look at um, the neuroanatomy um, or what their brain structure looks like on, um, through MRI scans and specialized imaging of the brain. Um, histopathology is a fancy word for saying we look under the microscope um, for cellular and molecular changes and we wanna know what role genetics play. But we realize that things are certainly much more complex than that. So we also are interested in lifestyle factors, the role of education, family history, and psychosocial factors, and how, that, how those factors play a role in someone's ability to maintain outstanding memory performance over time. So why are we interested in studying superagers? What's, what's the point? How does that fit into kind of the larger scope and picture? And, here I like to kind of stop and point out, okay, well, we've gotten pretty good at a medical, as a medical community at extending our lifespan. So people are living longer, but unfortunately this is unbalanced with our health span. So um, people are living longer, but those, those later years in life are not necessarily their healthiest years in life. And the superagers represent a, a more balanced approach where lifespan and health span um, are going more hand in hand. Superagers also give us the opportunity to inform our understanding of Alzheimer's research. Uh, we, one way to study Alzheimer's disease is to identify individuals who, who have Alzheimer's disease and uh, try to sort out how to reverse the problem or to uh, uh, fix the problem. The other way or another way to complement that research is to identify people who avoided Alzheimer's dementia and see um, what factors allowed them to avoid changes in these severe changes in memory loss. And this is how we think that the super aging um, research provides that complementary approach. We see that super agers are also really uh, they're able to help us redefine expectations. So right here is a picture of one of our super agers. And this was taken when she was um, age, I think 104, definitely over age 100. And it's a hard to see in this image, but she's beating. She's putting together a necklace um, while she's talking to the Chicago Tribune um, reporter who's interviewing her. And she's telling all about her daily life. 
And um, this, this super ager recently celebrated, um, or last summer celebrated her 106th birthday. And on the wall behind here are the uh, more than 200 cards that people sent her to celebrate her birthday. And I think she represents um, a great example of someone who's really redefining expectations of what's possible in aging. And the more images and stories that we can hear about that, I think it helps to redefine our own expectations of what's possible in aging. And we are very excited to um, celebrate her 107th birthday next month. Okay, then reducing stigma. So we heard this in the introductions about the village from, from the, some of the villages talking about the stigma that's associated with aging. And I think super ragers are again are a good example of how to reduce stigma uh, around aging. And this here is another one of our super ragers who really loves to travel. And in the background here um, are some penguins. Um, and so she's on one of her, her many travels. And so you might say, oh, gosh, this sounds great and fine, but can this ever translate to, to the real world? And um, so I thought I would bring in a, a real life example of what this might look like if we really valued our older adults more and, and thought about this redefining expectations and reducing stigma. So the next slide I'm gonna share with you is not my own work, um, but is a really inspiring story. Um, at least I found it to be really, an inspiring story. So I wanna teach you just for a moment and take a small deviation from super agers and talk about something called the friendship bench. So um, the friendship bench is something that was, uh, is an evidence-based program that was started in Zimbabwe. And what they found um, there locally is that one in four people suffer from depression and anxiety in, in Zimbabwe. And there was a tremendous shortage of medical care. There are 10 psychiatrists serving a population of more than 13 million Zimbabweans. Um, and that more than 70% of Zimbabweans live below the poverty line. And so there was this great need for medical care and a real dearth of medical care. And um, this evidence-based intervention was born to bridge the gap between mental health and treatment. And what they recognized is that there were um, many older adults and grandmothers in, in particular, they, they talk about who were in the community and, and trusted members of the community. And so what they developed was a problem, solve, a problem solving therapy and they trained um, the lay public about how to deliver this therapy um, and in particular grandmothers. And they literally had them sit on benches around the community um, out in the open to talk to individual. And so they, they talk about this idea of, of helping those with anxiety or um, thank you very much. And they describe their therapy rooms are outdoors and under the trees. And they found that their therapy was just as effective, if not more effective um, than, uh, was actually more effective than a, um, uh, an enhanced um, uh, con uh, usual care delivery. And so I think this is just one example about how we can think of uh, valuing our, our, our older adult population and, um, and finding ways to address critical medical needs. Okay, so we're gonna come back now to super agers. And this, this slide here shows you a little bit of our demographics of our super aging cohort. This is slightly out of date. We have um, a few more than a hundred super agers at this point. Um, this graph over here shows you that super agers are performing at least as well, if not better than their 50 to 60 year old peers and much better than their average 80 year old peers. We see that the majority of the super agers in our program tend to be women. Um, but before you ask, gosh, is there something special about being a woman? I think there's a couple of biases that are, are leading to um, this imbalance. One is that women live a little bit longer, but more importantly, women tend to volunteer for research more. At the end of this presentation, I'll talk about ways that you can stay connected with us, whether it's through our newsletter or participating in research. So especially the men in the audience, keep that in mind um, as, you, as you may wanna participate in research um, more here. 
We require super agers to be at least age 80 when they enroll, um, but they can join anytime after age 80. So the aged enrollment of our group, it, it ranges from 80 to 102. We um, have a range of education from 12 to 20, and the majority of the super agers um, are Caucasian and right-handed. And the best way to learn about super agers is of course to see one. So I'm gonna share a video now, um, one of my favorite videos of a, a super ager in our program. It's great that I'm a super ager. Uh, uh, it isn't something that I trained for uh, or, or I went to school for, uh, it just happened. And, and I have no idea why, but I, I'm extremely grateful that at this age that I'm able to, to uh, care for myself. And although I live with my daughter and her family, uh, I could just as easily live independently at this stage of my life. And, and as I mentioned, I live with my daughter and her husband and their three children. And so that's, uh, I have to adapt to that kind of life. Uh, they don't know much about Frank Sinatra or uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So you have to, I have to keep saying is Chance the Rapper uh, coming this week or is it Taylor Swift? So I do have to ask those kind of questions to be relevant. <laughs> and, and I have uh, said to myself, could it be my diet? And, and my daughter would say, you have the worst diet, uh, Dad. I have no idea how people, you know, who eat um, uh, TV dinners every night for many years, um, you shouldn't still be alive. And, and of course, the TV and the internet. I think the internet is so remarkable because you can ask questions that uh, years ago, we would never have been able to find the answers. So, so those things are all remarkable. So I, I love that video because it, it also typifies so many things that come through that the super agers share with us. So this idea of um, adaptability and resilience. So this this gentleman chose to live with his um, daughter and, and grandkids, and he has to find a new way to relate to them. Um, and then also themes of curiosity. And so I won't show data about curiosity today, but it is it is um, a term that comes up often. And this idea of um, of being curious and, and adaptable in 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 life. So. Cognition, thinking about, we, so I've said we selected super agers because they have great memory performance, but you might be kind of suspicious and say, well, gosh, what if they just had a lucky memory day when they came in? If you followed them over time, um, you would see that they weren't able to maintain that outstanding memory performance. So um, Tamar Geffen, who was a graduate student at the time, and I did this study um, looking over an 18 month period to see if super agers were able to maintain their memory performance. And this graph here shows that everything in the gray part um, uh, is average to superior range for 50 to 65 year olds. So that means super agers are performing at least as good as 50 to 60, 65 year olds. And we see that the majority of super agers are able to maintain that memory performance. And we've of course followed other super agers for longer periods of time. And we see that there are, are some who have been able to um, maintain that memory performance um, for more than seven or 10 or even longer um, years. So now that the study has been around for more than 10 years, we have um, quite a bit of longitudinal data um, from people who enrolled a long time ago. And then there are newer participants who you know, may have enrolled last week. So, um, there we just have um, their um, initial visit with us. The next question we asked was really thinking about, well, what do their brains look like? Do they look more like the 50-year-old brains that they, um, more like 50-year-old brains who they share memory performance with, or do they look more like average 80-year-old brains who they share chronologic age with? And so to do this, we asked the super agers to participate in um, an MRI scan of the brain. And then we have very fancy computer software um, and trained um, analysts in the lab 
who then go through and we label the brain, um, the outer part of the brain, which is here in red, and then the um, what we call the gray white junction of the brain here in yellow. And then um, we can measure the thickness between the red and yellow lines. And that outer layer of the brain is kind of like the bark on a tree. Um, and that's where our brain cells live. And by measuring the thickness of the brain, it gives us a proxy measure of the health of the brain. And we can do this for each individual, and then we can compare um, one group to another group. And so when we do this, we end up with pictures like this. Um, this is a picture of the side view of like a profile view of your brain. Um, this, your eyes would be over here, and this would be the back of your brain. And so this is kind of the example processing of the type of work that happens in my lab. And when we compare average 80 year olds to average 50 year olds, 50 to 60 year olds, we see a lot of red and yellow across the brain. And that means that the 50, or sorry, the 80 year old brains um, have some thinning relative to the 50 year old brains. And we see that this happens on the outer surface of the brain and also um, in the middle surface of the brain, if we split our head open there. Um, and this is, was not a new finding. This is something that has been reported before. But then we did um, the same thing, where, but we compared the average 50-year-olds to the superagers. And so before we get to um, what we found, we're going to do our next polling question. So superaging, superagers' brains are thinner, thicker, or about the same as um, their cognitively healthy uh, adults in their 50s and 60s. Okay, so everybody's still participating. That's good. Everyone's still awake. We haven't lost too many people. Um, we're getting some good answers in here. We're, whoa, we're above 80 respondents. Okay, we're leveling off here. We're over 90. I think we're going to hit over 100 again. We're so close. People are making their final decisions. Okay, we'll wait just a couple more seconds. All right, so let's look at this poll. We see that um, the majority of people are saying that superagers' brains are going to look about the same as people in their 50s and 60s. The next most popular answer is thicker. Okay, so let's see what we find on the next slide. Okay, so there's our average 80 year olds compared to our average 50 year olds. Now we're gonna look at superagers. So when I first saw this result, I thought that I had pressed the wrong button and that there was something wrong with our computer software. And um, what this actually means, though, is that the superagers' brains show the superagers showed no thinning compared to the 50 to 60 year olds. So it looked very similar um, to the 50 to 60 year olds when we looked at that that outer um, layer of the brain and that um, outside surface. And then, when we looked deep in the brain in that medial surface, we saw something even more surprising we found this blue area and blue was not a part of your tutorial. So if you think you're confused and you say, hey, 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 I don't remember, um, I didn't cover this yet. Blue actually means that the superager brains were thicker than the 50 to 60 year olds in this particular re region. So usually at this point, you know, if we were actually all in the same room, somebody's hand might go up and say, hey, 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 what is that region? What's it for? How do I get one? And um, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I, I don't know all of the answers to that question, but I can tell you a little bit more. So we call this region the anterior cingulate um, in the brain, and it's important for attention. And um, attention is really important for memory. So in order to remember something, you must be paying attention. So um, sometimes I tell the story that um, if I was asking my, my husband to go to the grocery store and to pick up a few different items and I was giving a list, um, but I didn't realize that he was paying attention to the college football game and not paying attention to the list, then there's no chance that when he gets to the store a short time later that he will remember uh, the items on the list. So 
because we found that the superager brains were thicker in this region, when we uh, did some of our other studies, we focused really specifically on this region to understand, well, what are the cellular features here? And we'll get to that in a second. Another question that might come to mind though is, well, how did superagers end up with this um, thicker brain cortex or this outer layer of the brain? And we know that on average, the normal um, ager brain is, is shrinking. Then did superagers start with bigger brains and they're still showing the same rate of shrinkage or do they have some sort of resistance to brain shrinkage? And ideally what we would have is MRI scans across the lifespan of superagers, but we, we don't have that information. So the next best thing we can do is we, we do ask superagers to come back over time so we can look um, across their visits at the rate of thinning in their brain. And when we do that, we see that the rate of thinning um, in the average 80 year olds is more than two times that of superagers. And so this makes us think that the superagers um, are on a different trajectory. So they have, they're able to resist um, this, the rate of uh, age-related atrophy. Um, and it, they're at a different trajectory than that of their 80 year old peers. So more recently, we've been, been doing, been looking at this, not only by thickness, but, but also thinking about the thickness and the shape of the brain. And so this, these are slides that were um, shared by another um, former graduate student in the lab, um, Adam Martyrstick. And so the brain has lots of folds in it. And we, saw, we call the depths, the, the, sul the sulcus or the sulci. And then these are the gyri or gyrus of the brain. And that's what all of these folds are here. And um, if this is a, this is one of the, this is a brain of a 64 year old in um, some of our research studies here and an average 84 uh, year, a cognitively normal um, 84 year old, we see that there's more space in between um, the gyri and sulci of the brain. There's kind of a widening there. And then this is a picture of a superager brain. And just to kind of highlight this more, you can see it with this um, green and red coloring where the red um, highlights the sulci or the depths of where it curves in. And we can use um, uh, special software to um, calculate that as a brain metric and we call it brain age. So we can look at some, you can compare someone's chronologic age, how old they are um, in years compared to what their brain age looks like. And we did this for 11 superagers. And what we found um, was that the brain age gap or the difference between um, someone's um, uh, predicted age and their chronologic age was more than 20 years. So superagers brains looked more than 20 years younger um, for all the superagers except for one who looked really close to their chronologic age. So their chronologic age kind of matched their brain age. But for all of these other superagers, their brains looked, you know, 20 years younger or, or more. So that's just another way to sort of calculate the health of the brain. And then this now we're going to kind of switch to histopathology, so looking under the microscope of the people who, who donated their brains. And before we go there, I thought we'd do one other video of a superager who, um, at the end of it, will talk about brain donation, and I think she does such a nice job. Now to our ongoing series of Brain Power today. This morning, Maria Shriver takes a look at an extraordinary group of people making a difference in brain research. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Hoda. Well, every 65 seconds in America, someone new develops Alzheimer's. But in Chicago, there's a rare group of seniors who not only avoid the diseases of old age, they maintain the brain power of someone more than half their age. Now each of them is giving a gift that could someday unlock the mysteries of growing old. I'm gonna make a butterscotch marshmallow When 104 year old Edith Rentro Smith makes cookies, nothing's written down. So where's your recipe? Mixed in are vivid stories of an amazing life. The first time she heard a radio. It was very exciting time. For that time, she met 
Amelia Earhart. You felt like you really knew her. How could she disappear? Born in 1914, the same year World War I broke out, Edith lived through 18 U.S. presidents and is still sharp as a tack. You've never struggled with your memory? Oh, no. Oh, no. How do you feel at 104? I feel good. Edith is a member of an elite group of seniors called super agers. These are individuals who are over age 80 and have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. Question is, how did they do this? It's a mystery. Emily Rogowski and researchers at Chicago's Northwestern University are trying to solve by gathering the largest group of super agers in the world. But to be invited in, you can't just be old. You must pass a test with 15 words. And they have to remember at least nine of them out of the 15. Out of the 15. To make it even harder, we even give them a distractor list in between. And then we ask them about that first list again. And some of them can remember all 15. So that's even more impressive. But it's what the super agers agree to do in the end that's really helping researchers. Each will donate his or her brain. This is one of the really important parts of the study is that people actually have given that ultimate gift of donating their brain at the time of death. Inside those brains, no, no, there's no, something no. else Edith and other superagers all have in common, and you don't need a microscope to see it. A positive attitude. So no complaining, no worry. No, you can't complain. She still reads four books a week, and the most stress you'll see from her, when she forgets those cookies, are in the oven. You have to agree to donate your brain. At the end. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They can't scoop your brain unless they get it. So unless they have my brain, they can't scoop it all. But all those little squiggles slide over they got in. <laughs> I think we're going to learn a lot from your brain. I hope so. I hope so. And if it helps somebody, Think how much that means to that individual if they just help. What's exciting about this, I think yeah. all the people in this are really excited because they feel they're doing a public service of sorts. They're donating their brains and they have this positive attitude about growing old, about their uh, ability to give this gift to the rest of us so we can learn about how to grow old and be a super ager, which is what we all want to be. It's like unlocking the secrets and they'll be right there. I think that's a, what's exciting in all of these studies is people want to know what are the secrets yeah. and we can only learn if people actually participate in these kinds of trials. All right, Maria, thank you so much. So I, um, I want to just point out a couple of things there. And one is the altruism of the people who are participating in our research studies. And we are so grateful and thankful for the, the, the time and the effort that we give and um, that they give. And the other is really understanding, you know, brain donation can be kind of a, a, an uncomfortable topic, but understanding why is it important? And I like to use the analogy of um, our old digital cameras. So when digital cameras first came out several decades ago now, um, everyone was really excited because we didn't need to have, we didn't need to worry about the amount of film that we had on hand. We could take lots of pictures and we could get instant gratification because we could look right on the back of that camera and see that picture immediately. But then we would go to print it out on our printer on a full sheet of paper and what we found was that those pictures were really pixelated and everybody became a little bit blurry that's because the resolution was not so great and now with time we've gotten much better at that and we have great resolution on our 20 megapixel cameras even on our smartphones but the analogy here is that during life we can only see with a certain resolution and that it's those who donate their brains and allow us to look under the microscope um, that allows us to look with a different and more sophisticated resolution at the cellular changes and other changes that are happening. So this is a, a very important part of, of the work that we do. And so I thought I'd tell you today about one of the things that we see under the microscope, and that's something called von Economo neurons. 
And if you don't know about von Economo neurons, you're among the majority. Um, most people don't, even in the neuroscience field. Um, but von Economo neurons or neurons are another word for brain cells, and they're really large brain cells, and they're pictured right here. Normally in the neuroscience field, we think about pyramidal neurons or pyramidal cells as being really big neurons. And as you can kind of appreciate here, the von Economo neurons are even bigger than that. Vodicotomal neurons are also unique because they are, um, they've only been described in two parts of the brain. One is the anterior cingulate, which if you remember from a few slides ago, um, that was the region that was blue and thicker in the superagers compared to 50 to 60 year olds, and then in the frontal insular cortex. Bonaconimo neurons have only been described in higher order species, and they're um, thought to have something to do with social behavior because the loss or abnormal development of bonaconimo neurons has been associated with autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, frontotemporal dementia, and even with Alzheimer's disease. So when we were looking at the anterior cingulate of the brain, um, we noticed the von Economo neurons. And so here is our last polling question of the day. Um, compared to average 80 plus year olds, superagers, do you think superagers have more von Economo neurons, less von Economo neurons, or about the same number of von Economo neurons? All right, everyone is still doing a great job of responding. Thank you, everybody. We'll give a little bit more time. The, ma the majority of people are saying more von Economo neurons in the superagers. All right. So I think we're inching towards the end here. We'll give just a few more minutes for those last few votes to trickle in. Okay, so as we go on, we see that superagers have more than four times the number of von Economo neurons, oops, compared um, to their um, cognitively average 80 plus year olds. And then we did a follow-up study, and this work, this work was led by uh, Dr. Tamar Geffen when she was a graduate student, and now she's a faculty member at our center, and um, Changi Skiola, who also leads the superaging study um, with, with me and Dr. Mejulam. And in this follow-up study, we saw that superagers have actually more von Economo neurons than even um, young individuals. And this young group um, consisted of people even in their 20s. So we're learning something special about even the cellular makeup of the, the superager cohort. So we're, we're, we're gathering lots of clues. So genetics. Um, genetics is an area that we're really early on in studying superagers. When you do genetic studies and you work with geneticists, they like for you to have um, thousands um, or tens of thousands of, of participants in order to do genetic studies. And we have a very small cohort. Um, and we're, so we're able to um, still do this work, but it, it's starting to ramp up more now. Some initial work we've done in the genetic space is to look at something called a polygenic hazard score. Um, that's a fancy way of saying a risk score. And this risk score um, is, was developed for Alzheimer's disease. And so we wanted to see how do superagers compare, where do they fall in this risk score? Or do they have high risk or low risk for Alzheimer's disease? And is their risk level different from cognitively um, average 80 plus year olds? And so what we see is that um, this zero line right here, if you were above zero, you would be a little bit higher risk. If you're below zero, you have lower risk. And what we see in our superagers is that they have, both the superagers and controls have lower risk than average, but they don't differ from each other significantly. So superagers aren't just the opposite of Alzheimer's risk. Um, so this tells us there's probably some more genetic complexity to be discovered there. And maybe I'll get invited back um, at some point to tell you more of that story in the coming years. All right, so one of the last things I wanna share today is about psychosocial factors. And um, we had the superagers 
fill out a questionnaire called um, the um, PWB 42, which stands for Psychological Wellbeing, and it has 42 questions. Um, sometimes we're not very creative in our naming schemes, but it gets to the point. And that's, that questionnaire is organized into six different domains, positive relations with others, purpose in life, self-acceptance, autonomy, environmental mastery, and personal growth. And when we compared the responses of average 80 plus year olds to the superagers, we found that the superagers were more likely to endorse um, um, strong positive relations with others. So satisfying, warm, trusting, high quality relationships with others. And this now gives us a lead to kind of understand, well, what are those relationships all about? But this fits very, very well with a really robust literature talking about the negative consequences of uh, social isolation and loneliness. And so we know very, very well that um, whether you are cognitively healthy or, or not, um, social isolation and loneliness are, are not good for you. And it re but it reinforces that, you know, if you're walking home today or you're, or you're thinking about whether to call that friend um, and say hello that you haven't chatted with for a long time, even if you're burnt out on Zoom calls and catching up, um, there are some, potentially some good brain benefits for keeping those relationships and staying connected. So um, I wanted to kind of transition to some of the data that are not necessarily published on the superagers, but kind of come up as the top five questions that people ask me about um, the superagers. And these are other pictures of um, superager participants in our, in our study. Um, so do they exercise often? We see that um, more than 80% of our superagers report currently exercising. Um, but there are certainly some who are very adamant about they, they have never regularly ex exercised and they, and they don't plan on starting soon. So there is some variability there, um, but we, we certainly know um, from uh, many, uh, an abundance of research, the importance of, exercises and of exercise and staying fit. Um, do they smoke or, or drink? We see that more than 70% um, of the superagers report uh, past tobacco use. Um, this is not an endorsement to go out and grab a pack of cigarettes. I think this is likely more reflective of the, um, the time period in which the superagers grew up where smoking was much, much more common. Um, and then more than 80% of them report uh, drinking alcohol. Um, again, this is another space where there's um, a bit of variability in some who have never had an alcoholic drink and others who um, will tell us that they feel that that's their secret to superaging is having um, a martini every day at, at five o'clock. When did they retire? We see that 15% uh, of the, more than 15% of the superagers are still working. And those who um, are not working are often volunteering or staying active um, in some other way. And this is a, I wanna take another small aside to tell one more story today. And this is of a research study. So people will often ask, gosh, well, you know, what's the magic thing should I be doing? You know, the crossword puzzles, if so, which crossword puzzle and how many times a week? And, um, you know, how do I keep myself active? And there was this really elegant study that was done um, several years ago by Denise Parks Group, where they took individuals, um, one group of individuals who, had never received um, formal training on, on photography and another group that had never received formal training on how to knit and then had a third group that was a control group. And they wanted to look at the brain benefit of um, the control condition versus knitting versus, versus photography. And what they found as a result of that study is that there was about the same brain, excuse me, brain benefit um, in knitting and in photography. And so the take home message here is that our brains like to learn new things and we like to be challenged. And so there's nothing particularly magical um, about crossword puzzles or knitting or photography. It's the idea that, is it something you enjoy doing? Does it challenge you? Um, if the answer is you know, yes and yes, then it's, it's likely to be good for your brain. Okay, 
so then the, the next question is, do, do super agers eat a lot of blueberries? And I, I always put this one in there, you know, kind of um, facetiously, but to say that um, a couple of things. In our super ager cohort, there's a wide variety of diets that people report. So um, as you heard from the gentleman who we showed the video of today, he eats a lot of TV dinners. Um, there are other super agers who are, are vegetarians and have a, a wide variety of um, of different diets. We do know, of course, that um, you know a heart healthy diet or a, a, a diet that, like the Mediterranean diet um, is also thought to be a, a brain healthy diet, but there is some diversity um, in, in our super ager co cohort. And I also bring up this question to point out that we're not necessarily looking for a single magic bullet. And so if you see an advertisement on TV that's, you know, take one of these and all of your worries will go away. Um, that's a good reason to be suspicious. And then the last one is, I think I know a superager. How can he or she enroll in the study? Well, gosh, we would love to hear from you. And I'm putting our website right here. Um, but we'll also, um, maybe Lisa could help me out and add it to the chat. Um, so you can find us on our website. You can um, email us. And then in just a second, I'm also going to share um, a phone number that, that you can use to call. Um, so in summary, we, we think of superagers as a rare phenotype. We say rare because it's difficult um, to find superagers. And um, today we, we walked through the idea that superagers are able to maintain their superior memory performance over time. They have thicker brains and less cortical shrinkage um, with time compared to their peers. They have an abundance of a special type of cell called von Economo neurons. They have low, but not unusually low risk for Alzheimer's disease. More than 80% of them are still active um, or exercising. They range in education from high school to advanced degree so far. Um, there are some who report a family history with longevity and others that have a family history with dementia. And they report having strong social relationships. So. Um, this work really would not be possible without the amazing team that, that I get to work with that really takes a village. And of course, it would not be possible without the super agers. And um, this is a picture here of when we used to all be able to be in the same building at the same time. And I look forward to these times again. Um, years ago, when we started the study, we, we pretty early on got requests of, when are we having a super aging party? I want to meet the other super agers. And so we've held three of these to date, um, and they've been a lot of fun and a great um, way for the super agers to get to meet each other and um, spend some time together while listening to some music and and um, having some snacks and drinks. And so I wanna end today by, you know, how can you stay connected with us? Super aging research isn't the only research that we do. Um, you may wanna stay in touch with us just because you wanna to get our newsletter and to hear what's happening in the world of um, aging and dementia research and, and treatment. Um, but you might also be interested in participating in research. And so I want to emphasize that um, we really uh, are always changing the studies that we're enrolling for. And we're looking for people who are healthy and for people who are worried about their memory loss or maybe experiencing changes in thinking. Um, and so we invite you to join our research registry. Um, and you can go to our website um, and and join the registry, we'll ask you a few questions. And when we find a study that might be good for you, we will reach out um, at that time and see if it sounds interesting to you. And if you say, yes, it sounds great, then we'll invite you to participate. Um, the majority of our research um, tends to happen in person, but we're, we're coming up with new models, um, uh, especially as a result of, of COVID.